Uh, so welcome to the third and final webinar in this series. Uh, while our presentation has been prepared on a joint basis, I will lead the narrative with Julie interjecting to keep me on point, add clarification, etc., cetera, uh, much as she does all the time, as those of you who know us well will confirm. Our presentation aims to take you through the key differences between a world ranking event and an ordinary level A event, major event, and hopefully demonstrate that these differences are not particularly onerous. For brevity, we don't intend to take you through an exhaustive list of detailed differences. Instead, we focus on the key areas in which these differences occur and highlight specific examples within each. Uh, we'll also spend a little time at the end outlining the role of the event advisor and how to become one. Hopefully slide two will now work. Excellent. Um, for those of us that don't know us, this slide will give you a little bit of background. Uh, we've been orienteering for a very long time. Uh, initially in Ireland, uh, we arrived over here in the UK in 1986. As competitors, we both represented Ireland at junior and better level. Uh, and Julie has represented Ireland at elite level for many years at World Cups and World Champs. We have planned or organized major events up to World Cup level. And a key highlight of our past event advising uh, activities was the successful Junior World Orienteering Championships in Aalborg in Denmark in 2010. Uh, our current commitments include, as you can see there, joint uh, event advisors for JK 2024 Day 1 World Ranking Event Sprint at Loughborough University, and we've just been confirmed as joint senior event advisors for World Masters 2026 in Poland. Wrong button. So we sent you out this, um, you'll be familiar with it. We didn't want you to, to we didn't want to get a vote uh, on which might be closer to your initial reaction, but just to set you thinking which of those two it might be. Uh, certainly in our experience working with major event teams over the years, the fear of the additional requirements of a WRE far outweigh the reality, which is a good thing. Um, and this has been helped over the years by the ever increasing alignment of British orienteering rules of orienteering with the IOF ones. Um, comment from me, I think because of the rule chairman, David Rosen, we are lucky in this country because the rules are, are similar, very similar, but we have, I have just been looking at the rule for Poland because we're going there in 2022, 2026, and I can't make head or, or tail them. Okay, my Polish isn't very good, but it's kind of different, so. Thank you. So, we will look at the additional requirements themselves, as, as I said earlier, particularly in the context of their impact on the organizer, the planner and the controller. Um, and then where to find details of them. And we've just for clarity split them between before the event, on the day uh, or during the event. Uh, and that includes things like planning, starts, course, finish, arena, et cetera, and after the event. Anyway. Why apply for WRE status for your event in the first place? Well, first a bit of background about world ranking events. They were established in 1998, uh, replacing by, by IOF Council, replacing what were previously known as IOF elite events. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, along with other IOF high level events, such as the World Champs, World Cups, etc., they award ranking points, which feed into the world ranking lists. There are separate lists for Sprint and Forest though, okay? Okay. There were several objectives behind in the introduction of World Rank events, including uh, the promote, encouraging the promotion and development of orienteering across the world by encouraging as many federations as possible to stage high-level orienteering events, uh, to harmonize the quality of those events across the regions and countries that organize them to motivate uh, competitors, including those coming up through the ranks, to compete at world ranking events, organized by both their own federation and others in order to earn world ranking points, and to provide a means of establishing qualification criteria and starting orders for major IOF events. 
So as an ex-elite orienteer for Ireland, we got started in the first block every time because we were making tracks for the more senior and um, more qualified, um, better orienteers. So this is a way to up your um, starting block if you do a lot of world ranking events for elite competitor. And do well in it. Yeah. <clears throat> so turn now to the reasons to put on a WRE. Well, little or no extra work is required over and above a typical British level A or major. Ah! Ah! Bless, Bless you. you. Uh, to meet the WRE criteria. Um, as Julie said, we're quite lucky here because there's been a tremendous alignment of the rules with the IOF funds. And in other countries, and not, not just Poland, we have come across quite a lot of differences. Um, and then you have to overcome those local differences and convince uh, the officials why actually we you know, we need to go with the IOF rules. And it's not just a question of banging a table and insisting you actually have to bring them along with you. So that's one of the challenges. Uh, they provide more opportunities for elite domestic based orienteers uh, of the host federation to earn world ranking points without having to travel overseas. Uh, which is particularly important for aspiring elites, including those on the fringes, older juniors, et cetera, et cetera. They provide an opportunity to attract more overseas based entrants to the event, which is always a good thing. And there's no limit to the number of WREs that a federation can nominate in any one year. In fact, um, sorry, I'm I just got a. <laughs> A notification um, about a restart, which I don't need. Um, <clears throat> so there's no limit to, to the number, and in fact, um, it is in the interest of federations to to have as many as possible, because the world ranking list is then used for world elite qualification purposes. On the next slide, these are the two key documents, um, the sources of that detail the requirements of a WRE. On the left is the IOF competitions, competition rules for foot orienteering events, world ranking event edition. So what IOF in recent years have done is they've taken their standard boilerplate rules document, which gets updated every year, and they've produced shorter ones that are specific to the rules of, in this case, world ranking events, but they will have one for world cups, world masters, uh, world champs, etc. Yeah, uh, this has shortened the actual documents themselves from the original, which had special rules for all these competitions listed. They're published on the IOF website and usually updated annually. And if, in fact, there is one coming for WRE. Yes, so the, the I'm showing, I think, WRE 2023 there, but yeah. 24 has been approved, we understand, and it's just awaiting publication. So where to find the details? It's essential that organiser, planner and controller familiarise themselves with both these documents. But also, we have found team leaders of key functions such as start, download, results, etc., need also to be familiar with at least the sections that relate to that function, because on occasion they know their function better than the overall organizer. So if they spot something which might be difficult to comply with, it's better to get get it straight from them at the earliest opportunity. One of the first things we do uh, on being appointed as event advisor is, and after having made contact with the organizer. We check that the organizer, planner and controller are aware of the documents, first of all. Ideally, they're familiar with them, but if they're not aware of them, we then ask them to familiarize themselves with the latest version and ask that they do it as soon as possible. Um, following on from that, we would be asking them to ensure that the event should be able to meet all the mandatory requirements. And if there's any doubt about any, to raise it with us through the national controller at the earliest possible opportunity. In this way, if the event advisor is supportive, a rule variation can be sought in good time. IOF rules and WRE manual mandatory requirements take precedence over BOF rules where conflicts occur. However, over, as I said earlier, over the years, the BOF rules have been re revised to increasingly align with IOF rules. Um, an example being 
the recent equalization of men's and women's winning times. As we said earlier, in our experience, little if any extra effort is required over and above a normal level A major event to, us, to satisfy the requirements of a, w, a WRE. And as we say there, it's the fear of the unknown that far outweighs the reality when we actually have knuckled down to it. So turning to the differences as they occur, obviously you have to apply for WRE status. This should be submitted as early as possible in the year preceding the year of the event with an absolute minimum period of six months before the event. In practice though, it really needs to be applied for at least 12 months and ideally longer in advance to allow the event advisor to be satisfied with the quality of the train, which is one of the event advisor's key uh, tasks. If possible, actually, it's quite helpful to involve an event advisor in the application process itself uh, as early as possible as they can um, go and visit an area, for instance, even before the application is in. The application must carry the endorsement of BOF, uh, and there is a process for obtaining this, which I'm not going to go through here. And if any rule deviations are likely to be needed and they're known at the time of the application, these must be included at that time. Moving to approval, IOF will advise the Federation of the success or otherwise of their WRE application. And that's that. And in um, most cases, certainly, and um, WREs that UK have applied for in recent years have been approved on most a small most. number of occasions. They have subsequently not proceeded for a, for a variety of reasons, um, but they have been approved at the initial application stage. IOF office then opens a page for the event in the event calendar on Eventor, which is uh, IOF's database, and they will populate it initially with outline details extracted from the application. The organizer of the event is then allocated editing details and takes responsibility from that point on for keeping the event page updated, adding details as they become available, such as embargoed areas, age classes, entry deadlines, fee increases, uh, fee increase steps, uh, bulletins, etc. At the same time, the event advisor establishes contact with the event team at the very least, the organizer and the national controller. As previously mentioned, we'll cover the role of the event advisor at the end of the presentation, so we'll, we'll skip past it now. Moving on to the controller, in addition to their role in relation to the overall event, the national controller takes on the additional responsibility of assisting the event advisor in relation to the WRE elements. Where the national controller is also an IOF event advisor, the roles can be combined. However, our strong personal preference is to keep both those roles separate in order to ensure that the required focus on the WRE is not inadvertently diluted. The only age classes at a WRE are M and W21E. Other classes can be accommodated, uh, split out, etc., within the event results, e.g. the JK Sprint, which combines M18, 20, 21E and W18, 2021E into courses one and two respectively. Those results can be split out in the JK event results, but on the WRE results that are displayed Eventor. and ultimately uploaded to Eventor, there is just the one class and they're just listed in the order in which they um, yes. finished. Yeah. Entries is next, and a decision needs to be taken quite early on whether or not to facilitate entries through Eventor. This is encouraged by IOF, but in practice is not taken up in this country when the WRE is part of a larger event with multiple classes, days, again, such as the JK. <laughs> and, and it's not mandatory, but it is mandatory to have an up-to-date page for the event on Eventor and to provide details there of how you do enter the event. Bulletins containing minimum mandatory details of the event must be published by set deadlines. Uh, there's only two in the cases of uh, world ranking events. And 
they can be incorporated into the final details of the, the event, provided they, they actually cover all mandatory areas. The start list is produced strictly based upon the IOF world rankings in reverse order. And usually the listing about three weeks before the event date. Uh, so the top ranked athlete on that date starts last and the lowest ranked athlete in, in who has entered starts first. Obviously, where you've a lot of unranked athletes uh, and the like, you can apply other criteria for putting them in order at the beginning of the field. The start list must have no gaps and it must be approved by the event advisor before publication. Again, the WRE start list takes precedence over both seeding rules where any conflicts might arise. This used to cause issues over the years, but it's another area where the BOF rules have been aligned to reduce the risks of any such conflict. The world ranking jury is often different to the jury for the rest of a level A major event. It's ideally made up of licensed events, event advisors, preferably from different federations. The complaints protest process is broadly similar with some minor procedural differences between the world ranking event and sorry the world ranking event and non world ranking event classes there are very specific map printing standards to be met in relation to world ranking events for example a proof must be provided um, at an early date and compared to an iof print text sheet for print quality um, not going to go into it in detail, but there are separate processes for offset and digitally printed maps. Uh, with adjustment, and the event advisor then can insist on adjustments being made if the clarity of the map isn't isn't up to standard compared to these sheets. Other things like the IOF logo must be included uh, on the map as well, and must clearly show the world ranking event status of the event. There are also planning considerations to be taken into, into account. Uh, for example, waiting competitors at the start mustn't be able to see the route choice of departing competitors to the first control. There are limits to the number of competitors that can share any one control, i.e. The, the flows through any control that's shared with, with other courses. The last 20 meters of the finish run-in must be straight. And ideally, spectators should actually be able to line the last 100 metres. Another key difference with the BOF rules relates to the provision of refreshment um, to competitors during the race. Where the estimated winning time is 30 minutes or more, refreshments must be made available at least every 25 minutes based on the estimated winning time. During the event, a model event must be provided for all WREs. Now that sounds quite demanding, but it's generally accepted that this requirement can be satisfied with the provision of a small section of map of the warm up area with a few controls in it. A sample of the control setup must also be provided with a live electronic punching unit to allow the competitors to practice punching. Not everybody is familiar with every punching method. A pre start must also be provided. And that provides the competitors with a quiet waiting area, warm up facilities, toilets, if the main toilets are, are far away, access to start lists, race time display, and drinks if there are refreshments out on the course. The start area itself should be quiet and there should be good separation between the pre-start and the start. There is a requirement for results showing the final times to be displayed throughout the race. Nowadays, this is often satisfied by the use of making, uh, by making use of live results on the internet. When part of a larger event, live commentary needs to prioritize the WRE classes. And there is very detailed guidance on facilitating live commentary up to and including TV coverage in an appendix within the current version of the WRE manual. After the event, prize giving ceremony should be held as soon as practical, practicable after the finish. If part of an overall prize giving for the whole event, the WRE element should be prioritized. 
if the overall event prize giving is to be held at another time or venue, a simple prize giving such as a flower ceremony should be held at the event arena to celebrate the athletes on the WRE podium. And very importantly, after being approved by the IOF event advisor, the official results must be, must be published online on the day of the, of the race and uploaded to IOF event or in the prescribed format. As mentioned earlier, the two main documents which detail the requirements of WRE are as follows, and we've just provided some links there on the assumption that these will be circulated afterwards. But anybody can always contact us um, if, if they're having any trouble uh, accessing these documents. And finally, the role of the event advisor. The event advisor's key tasks include effectively overseeing the whole event, identifying vulnerabilities and risks of failure, and ensuring they're brought, brought to the organizer's attention, effectively the controller. They are assisted by the national controller, who's generally the controller for the rest of an event, which is run in conjunction with the WRE, such as JK, British Champs, etc. As mentioned before, these roles can be combined, but we don't favor it. The role of the event advisor is primarily to provide support, help and advice to the event organizers, primarily the organizer and controller. They have a shared responsibility for the successful outcome of the WRE. So it's very much a team effort. Some specific key tasks include approving the terrain, the maps, the courses, the bulletins, the timekeeping system results, etc. Much as that list there, and to chair the jury if one is convened, but strictly on a non-voting basis. Can I sneak in with a quick question for your own, yeah. Julie? Yeah. Um, John's just asked in the Q&A section, and do you have a reference in the IOF rules that states that world ranking event jury members should be IOF um, event advisors? It sounds like a good yeah. idea, but he hasn't found them. Yes, there is, um, and we can point that out it's probably in the WRE manual. Yeah. Um, I think, did I mention that? Yeah, you did. Yeah, it, it's definitely in there. We can provide it uh, later on. That sounds like something I can send out in the email. Yeah, yeah that's fine. We'll, we'll certainly do that. Thank um, you very much. No problem. Uh, so, okay. final, oh, penultimate slide, I think, which I'll bring up. So this is a bit of a plea. Uh, we need more UK IOF event advisors to increase the current pool of 12. 10 of those 12, in addition, 10 of those 12 are in their 60s and 70s. That includes us, by the way, youthful and all looking as we are. We just turned 60. And the other two are almost 60. So we really need to attract some younger event advisors. Um, now, a lot of the current pool of event advisors, including ourselves, have been event advisors for many, many years since we we're, were a lot younger. So it is an interesting role for, for younger people. It's a very satisfying role, um, which can, you know, you can make a real difference to a major event. It probably would appeal mostly to existing controllers, but one doesn't have to actually be an existing accredited controller to be an event advisor, but it does definitely help. Um, the key qualifying criteria are up there on screen. You have to be an active, experienced orienteer who has competed outside their home country. That bit about experience abroad is really important. Um, controlled or played a major part in the organization of a major national or international orienteering event in the last three years, and attended and, and actively participated in an IOF event advisors clinic. If there is any interest, uh, which people can indicate after this um, workshop, um, I don't mean today, just after having a think about it, they should contact David Rosen because he would consider organizing a clinic here in the UK later this year to qualify some event advisors. Uh, it's typically a two day uh, course with some practical uh, exercises in it. So, Final slide, I believe. 
hopefully this we've improved your uh, if if you ha if you were on the downer side on WREs, hopefully we've improved your opinion of them and the fact that here in the UK they don't add a huge amount of extra work and uh, that uh, emoticon I think it's called emoji. Uh, our emoji uh, better reflects uh, the, the group thinking now. Uh, so thank you very much for your time and any questions? Yeah, no, not not to follow up a different one. Um, first of all, the um, IOF uh, rules were updated at the start of the year. They, they are, the 2024 have been out for some time now. I think you said yeah. that they, they're still waiting for them to be approved, but they've been out no, for no, some sorry, time. Just, just, just to clarify, it's the manual that ah, we're waiting yet, for the yeah. updated version. The, the, one, the rules we've shown there are the 24 ones. Right, cool. Okay, yeah, because there were some differences there to do with disciplinary panels and so on. Um, yeah, the other that, thing that was going to be released very soon because we have had a copy of them. The manual. The manual yeah, yeah. Um, to work with on the JK. Yeah, apologies for my other question. I hadn't heard of the manual before because in the other disciplines, I don't think there is a manual. So uh, I hadn't heard of that one. So I, I've only ever, only ever looked at the, at the rules, which are consistent across all the disciplines. And there was no requirement there for that. Uh, for the them to be IA, EAs. Uh, the other question was, there was an issue at the JK Wales where um, following at the time British orienteering rules, um, a previous map of the area was displayed on assembly as the BOF rule says it should be. Um, and one of the, um, when, when they finished their runs, one of the uh, um, competitors who on the world ranking event came back and saw that and immediately um, jumped up and down and rushed and grabbed the EA and got them to rip it down because the IOF rules say the reverse. You must not have any right. maps on display. Is there any, um, I know David isn't here, is there any way to reconcile that for the future? Has the British orienteering well, rules changed? I mean, we think it should be. Um, it's one of the things you know, we've already discussed with Simon, who is the controller for JK Day 1 World Ranking event at, at Loughborough. Um, so, Typically, where you have had a previous map of an area, you would also have blank maps in the start lanes. They, they won't be there in the world ranking event start lanes. They may well be, there's a separate start for the world the two world ranking event classes at Loughborough. Uh, they may be in the other classes lanes, but they won't be in the world ranking event and none will be displayed anywhere around the arena or at the event site. Now, it's still depending. People can have them in their cars, they can have them on their phones, they can have them on their tablets. Um, the rule is a bit broader, the IOF rule, which says you just mustn't, you mustn't look at them, you mustn't consult with them, and they mustn't be on display. Yeah, most countries, they can be at the car park, but can't be at assembly in any form. Yeah. Um, yeah. The problem is your car park can be right beside assembly, arena, etc. So a blanket that they're just not there is better. Okay, thank you very much for that. Yeah, um, they, there was just a quick one for me in there who asked for a link to the uh, manual, which uh, Alistair has kindly provided. And uh, I'll also, I've just downloaded myself a copy of that, which I'll pop out in the email as well, just so everybody's got it handy somewhere. But we we'll be aware this would be updated very, very soon. soon. The, okay. the manual will yeah. be updated very soon. <clears throat> no problem. Uh, I can't see any more questions at the moment. So I think you've uh, gotten off somewhat lightly. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, yeah. Thank you. Um, on to the next session, which is about being on the jury. Um, I hope you've had your pre-reading, pre-session reading material um, and you've uh, got some opinions. We're now going to ask Joe to weave his magic and put us into groups. Uh, there are going to be four groups uh, with Simon, Neil, Barry and Ronan and Julie doing a double act. Uh, three of you will be going into breakout rooms and Ronan and Julie's will be staying in this room. Uh, you will then have about 20 minutes to talk through at least one scenario, get on to others if you've got time, and then we'll have reporting back after that. Simon, would you like to start giving some feedback on this? Um, yeah. <laughs> As you can imagine, there's been detailed discussions. 
Uh, so let, let's try rapidly going through in, in the order that, that things happen. So the, we've got the complaint um, about this issue here. Um, and the first question was, were we happy with the organisers' response? And, and, and the short answer was, well, given the circumstances and the time available, I think the organiser had probably looked at the right sort of things, come up with probably a, a reasonable answer on the day. Um, there was some concern that maybe just looking at the splits wasn't enough and there should be some sort of sense checking of how fast those splits were. Um, it, you know, if everyone's running the same speed, it might be because they're all crossing the wall, which is potentially what's happened. Um, so that may, maybe there should have been a little bit more thought about sense checking that we, we can't see, but anyway. Um, and the, the interesting point that th this is a scenario that really you need to be trying to plan and control out before you even get here. So if, if, if there's any, if, if on the ground when you get there, it looks like you could get through, that's really a problem that's happened at the controlling and planning point of view, um, unfortunately. But anyway, so in, in the short term, we were happy that that's a reasonable response for the organiser on the day, given the, the time available and the information available. Um, so subsequently, it becomes obvious that no people have really done this and, and a significant number. We, we, we were told six out of nine, so. That, that's you know a, a good proportion of those who've, who've, who've um, owned the but the route up have, have gone this way. I'm <coughs> happy that the GPS is, is telling us there's been a real issue. I think in this case, yes, if it was just accidentally drifting into and out of bounds and back out as you run along a path, clearly not. But when it's straight across an uncrossable feature like this, it's that the GPS seems a reasonable evidence that it's happened. Um, what could the organiser do at that point? Well, we went through, as you can imagine, you, you can avoid the courses. As ever, there's for some reason quite a lot of reluctance to avoid courses. Um, we had the standard long discussion about could we take the leg out um, uh, and the, the rules have got lots of detail about how you would consider taking legs out uh, and, and warn against it. And I strongly warn against it because um, it has all sorts of, of repercussions and knock on effects which you're not fully aware of. So that's not ideal, certainly. So it then comes down to a really question of how, how could you find out who actually went the wrong way, what went through here and who didn't. Um, so for the people who put their route up, fundamentally they, they, they're owning up to having broken a rule. The, the, the rule is you should not cross features like this, so therefore the, the rules say that you should be disqualified if you break that rule. Um, so the suggestion is they should be contacted to, to say, could you explain what what you did here? Um, and if they can't explain or, or, or you know, if they admit to having broke across that uh, wall, then they should be disqualified. Um, the question then comes, what about the people we don't have routes for? Can we do anything about those? Um, Martin was fairly keen on just using running times to decide what was a sensible time or not. Um, it's a possibility, but it, it, it's it's not a good idea, I don't think, because some people made a, might have made a mistake going the going the valid route, but still made a mistake on it. So you could easily lose a minute on that leg, even if you went um, if if you went the proper way. Um, so I, I don't think you can just use split times to determine. Um, so one of the things we were, were discussing is whether you just contact everybody who ran that course and say there's been this issue. Um, point out that if you have crossed that, taken that straight route across the wall, you've, you've crossed a, a, something you shouldn't have done and, and to volunteer that, that that was the case. And then self, well, you would be disqualified or we come up with some arrangement of you know, showing you as non-competitive in the results or something. Um, because I'm not sure, we had a discussion about whether people will have known they were breaking a rule. And, and whilst at the top level, yes, they, they certainly will. There's a lot of events in Britain where people will be uncertain or not clear, no matter how much we try and tell them that they've actually broken a rule. Um, so that's just something that we need to be aware of. <coughs> so, I think that's covered most of the points we were um, looking at. 
That's lovely, thank you. Um, Ronan and Julie, have you got anything from your group to add to that? Uh, no, um, <clears throat> similar conclusions that the organisers' initial decision seemed reasonable. Um, our group felt as well that they should have looked at more than just the first four, um, you know, maybe six or maybe more. I mean, considering six, the first nine appeared to have done it. Um, then, you know, you had Simon's point about contacting everybody. Um, we also covered contacting all the runners to find out and any must be disqualified that uh, admit that they went over. Uh, our group felt the planning was poor and this was pretty much trying to trick competitors in this particular instance, putting the previous control on the junction of the little paths, um, really encouraging people to continue on down that path and hit 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 the wall or go over it in this case. So really not good planning, not good controlling. Um, asking people, look, please don't cheat. This is Simon's education point. Um, we came across that as well. We had a lot of discussion about the fact that the leg could be voided in non-IOF or lower level events. But as Simon said, that leads to other problems. Um, and the conclusion seemed to be plan to avoid such situation and uh, make 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 the planning clearer try and avoid it in the first place um, and and you know, it's an unfortunate situation i i don't run i don't think it's a bad leg if it is when on the ground it is physically impossible to get through that gap because it is it is a sprint trap it's taking people into a, a dead end that they shouldn't have gone into um, but but it does rely on there being absolutely no way they could get across that wall. And but that wall, is, it's a tiny bit of heavy black, um, very it, hard to see on the road. You, you, you could criticise the mapping as well. Yes, this is where you should should you put some. So maybe a purple, a yeah. purple bar would have would have helped. And in yeah. fact, that did come up in yeah. in our group yeah. as well. But education, maybe we have to educate people more. And Simon, the other, the other thing is, if that was a genuine trap, then really there should have been an official place at it. But not, in my opinion, on the far side with a camera, yeah. but actually on the near side yeah. to say, you go over this, you're disqualified. Okay, thank you very much. Should we go on to the next one? <laughs> Which is Barry. All right. Yes. Uh, sorry. Can I sneak in quickly? Um, John's got his hand up at the moment. I just wanted to uh, check that one quickly before we move on to Barry. Oh, so, yeah, you're saying about um, education and stuff about uh, legal and legality stuff. There is a there's a very thin black line to the right of it, which I think is marked as crossable crag. It could be uh, as opposed to impossible. And it looks a continuation of that. And the tags are taken off. Um, I, I can't tell on this scale what, what that is. So it looks so potentially it is um legal uh for uh for competitors oh that's what a competitor could think how how easy is it to check how thick that black line is it compared to the i think it actually thickens doesn't it rather than the bit to the, to the right of it so it is um i think even well educated people might still make the same mistake but the but the mistake should have been worked out when you worked out how far they were jumping down let me just share the actual um, live. Can you see that now? Oh. That, this is the actual live locks um, playback system. So that, that's the, the crag zoomed in. So it, uh, it's, yeah, it's a crag here, but I think it's, it's a solid, it's a thick black line yeah. all the way. Oh, it is. Okay. Yeah. But, mm. but you're right. It, it, it's not drawn. Well, no, it's probably drawn as well as it can be. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Anyway, but, but, but we, I think people are fully aware of the issues, so we, we're probably done with that one. <laughs> Stop sharing that. You may have to reshare yours now. Yeah, Alan. I'm just gonna. Sorry. <laughs> Ooh, I saw my own face, and that was scary. You stole my screen. <laughs> but, <In> fact, <coughs> okay. I'm Barry. Go on, Barry. <laughs> this was a multi-day event where. An enthusiastic control collector started collecting the controls in before the course closing time. Um, the things we covered, first of all, there was a, a, a rush to call the jury. And actually, you have to remember that the 
complaint goes to the organiser and there's quite a process to follow before the jury ever gets called. Um, we looked at the sorts of things we should consider and the fact that all these competitors have actually been out for quite a long time, i.e. well over two hours, um, therefore meant they weren't going to affect any of the leading positions on the day. Um, and it was only the it was the controls right near the finish that were affected. So we did have the results for or the times for quite a lot of the course. And there were discussions about should we have terminated the course, perhaps three controls from the end um, and just adjusted everybody's results accordingly. And the, so the feeling there was actually no, you know, all bar these people right at the end had actually completed the proper course. And we know from a fact, as soon as you start taking controls out, you start to affect results elsewhere. I, you could have changed the winners of most of whom had probably gone home by now thinking they'd won the event or won the day. Um, so other options were to scale up the competitors' time based on how long it would take them to do the parts of the course they had done. Um, this was would have involved quite a lot of complicated maths, so that was dismissed as probably not a very easy thing to do. Um, so um, I don't think we actually reached any conclusion other than this was a very hard thing to uh, to judge because no matter what you did, somebody could be upset. If you change the results, those that had finished early would be upset. If you didn't change them, then you would upset the people who were being disqualified for not finding controls through no fault of their own. Uh, and I was actually on the jury for this, although the jury never got called. Um, and it was agreed between the organiser, planner, controller uh, and myself sort of helping the organiser come to a decision. And in the end, the, the, the real concern over these competitors that had finished so long and so late was that actually they just wanted a, f a finishing time for the day. They'd all been out well over two, two and a bit hours. Um, and their concern was more that they actually didn't get disqualified for not punching certain controls than whether their result was two hours, 15 minutes or two hours, 30 minutes. So in the end, I think the download time was used as their finish time and they were not disqualified for missing the controls out. So um, it's one of those things, there's no fair way of actually resolving this problem, but doing something like voiding the course certainly wasn't what people wanted. Uh, can I come in on that? Uh, um, yep. No, they, they weren't reinstated. Um, there's about 12 people affected and I'm just looking at the results at the moment because uh, I obviously got all the all the uh, SI timing files and they weren't reinstated. There were people who finished outside and didn't punch the finish. The finish control was still there. The finish control did not get removed. It uh, finished control was handed back in before uh, it was back at download before uh, half past three. Uh... Were, it affected a couple of people. You may have agreed what should happen, but nobody nobody ever told me to do anything. So we won't have this argument here, but there I can I know there's at least one person that punched their last three controls and the finish control at the finish control. <laughs> yes. Which is where, yes. which is where they've they been dropped. Yeah. All right. So whether it happened, the, the organiser's decision was that those people should not be disqualified. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and don't forget, if people did finish after, well, you could argue if they finished after 3.30, they should have been disqualified anyway because they were over time, but yeah. we'll forget that. Right. It could have, been, it could have been a long time looking for the uh, collected It control. could have been, yes. Which I don't know what you do if you've got control errors, which forces people to go beyond the course closing time. You don't. That's, control perhaps, for, that's perhaps for a discussion for another day. Yeah, yeah. Uh, David, you had your hand up, I think. Yeah, j just a quick comment that uh, I was the event advisor at a World Cup a few years ago, where a similar thing happened. But of course, at a World Cup, the fastest runners were starting last the best oh, yeah. runners were starting last so yeah. they were the ones who were affected 
and we did actually have to void the course. Yeah. Thank you. Was there another hand? Yeah, Alan, I was going to say, oh, Steve, I, did, yeah. I did mention it to Barry. Um, my experience of being on the jury is try not to get too close to the com yeah. to the organiser and help with the um, with how he's going to answer the complaint, because that puts you in a difficult position then as a jury member, because you've already had a view on how you're going to answer this complaint. So I know it's very easy to get tempted into uh, try and help, but you really need to stay away for most yeah. of it. Yeah. Uh, the, the IRF rules actually specify that complaint mustn't be discussed with the jury or indeed a protest until it's put to them formally. Yeah. In, yeah. Indeed, and, and that's the approach I normally try and take at Bath as well. Yeah. Okay, are we ready to move on? Yeah, happy, I'm happy. happy with that, Barry? Yes, happy with that. Okay, on to Neil's group. Hey. Yeah, so we spent about 30 seconds agreeing that crossing the fence per se was not an offence because it's uh, yeah. not a sprint event. And so you are technically allowed to cross the fence however high it is. And so the most of our discussion was then about the rule about causing damage to a fence because it was, it was claimed that the fence is damaged and therefore what the outcome was about someone being shown to, to damage a fence. And so then the, the issue was very similar to the first one. How do you prove who the culprits were? A thing we wanted to add that Simon didn't mention was that things like root gadget, the traces aren't necessarily the person who they're assigned to. It's, it's quite possible to put up your own trace against someone's, someone else's name, which I did a few weeks ago. Very easy to do. And so you have to contact that person to, to prove that that trace is actually theirs. And and so this this really came down to, yeah, we were the complaint would be that the organizer would say, yeah, no rules have been broken and less damage can be proved. So then it's a case of did anyone see the the person causing damage, you know, forcing a hole in the fence or, or whatever? Were there other witnesses? Did the person own up to it, etc.? So yeah, we spent a good 10 minutes talking about defining damage and, and proving, proving guilt. And I think that was about, I guess the only caveat we did briefly talk about was going back to the uncrossable features, that there are some situations where, and, and sort of moorland walls are a classic example, where the event does make all of them uncrossable, forbidden to cross. For, for very good reasons. And if that's made, made very clear to competitors and you know, details at the start, big signs everywhere, then that would make such linear features forbidden to cross without putting the red lines on purple lines on because they cause too much clutter on the map. But there's no evidence that was the case here. Neil, am I OK to interject as we've got a few hands up? Yep, go for it. Uh, I'll, I'll move on to Simon and uh, I'll come back to you. Yeah, I was just going to make the point that the, the rule 7.3 says competitors must not deliberately cause damage. And I think I'd really yeah. struggle to find anyone who's deliberately crossing a fence to break it. <laughs> so, well, we, we, we did consider the possibility that I had a pair of wire clippers, in, <laughs> which, would, which would satisfy that criterion. But yeah, mm -hmm. otherwise it's very difficult to prove deliberate damage. And we also talked about the fact there is a rule Claim you have to report damage if you cause yeah, it. Yeah, it's the same rule. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so in fact, no, if the fence wasn't damaged. That's the point, isn't it? Okay. Yeah. Uh, we've got David next. Yeah, just say I I disagree with Neil and echo Martin's point that he made earlier. Um, that all the information has to be on the map and just putting up signs or uh, having something in the final details isn't good enough. If you if you've got uh, uncrossable fences or, or dry stone walls, they have to have a purple line on them uh, if you're not allowed to cross them. And if that makes the map too cluttered, well, you have to think about uh, changing the course a bit so that it's 
uh, still fair. No, I, th I think we all, we all agree with that concept, but it has happened in the past that these things have been made. And ideally, you need to put controls at the styles, the crossing points or, or something to force people there. Um, quickly, uh, Henry's popped in the chat as uh, an alternative saying such, fe such fences often have breaks in them when not maintained by the owner. Unlikely here. Um, so thank you for that one, Henry. Well, it, it, it may well be likely. You know, mappers don't always get things absolutely right. They see a fence, they, they miss a gap. And if you see a gap, you go through it. And uh, finally, Brian. Just to reiterate again that the GPS track here is not really evidence because this is, looks like an urban area for one thing. It could be tall buildings around, it could deflect signals. Um, my own track from the race yesterday at Burnham Hill shows me taking a detour nearly 50 metres I didn't take. And that was in a relatively good position on an open hill. You just can't trust GPS tracks to the level of accuracy that uh, we'd like to. Thank you. Thank you very much. But uh, just going back to that symbol with the double tags, that ISPROM does say it shall not be crossed. So without a purple line, a competitor shall not cross it. This, this is ISOM. This is ISOM. It says yeah. at the bottom. Oh, sorry. OK. Um, and uh, Henry clarified, sorry, uh, on that one before, Neil, when he said um, uh, we're not maintained about the brakes, uh, unlikely to be maintained. Um, so I think it was just clarifying on that one. Um, but I'll, uh, I'll disappear again now because I think that's all hands. Oh, no, Ian's coming last minute with one. Go on, Ian. Uh, I've just been thinking about this. With, with the first two examples, you could say to the plan, planner or controller could have avoided this happening by by doing things a bit differently, or the organiser in the control collection case. What I'm trying to work out in this one is: there anything planner, controller, or organiser could have done to prevent get them getting themselves into this situation? Purple line. Move the control. Put the control at the tunnel north entrance. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then a tape route through the tunnel if you want them to use the tunnel. I mean, there's always a lot of factors. I mean, it depends what that fence looks like. If that fence, yeah. you know, it said it's two metre high, most people are not even going to consider doing it. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, it already had holes in. If it, if it already had holes in, then, yeah. Sure. Just you would mitigate Just move the control to the tunnel. It, yeah. It would have been oh, yeah. easier. Yeah. Yep. OK, thank you very much for... For all of that. Um, I don't know whether I should confess this, but I was the controller for the last scenario. Um, and, and you're all right, and uh, it should, ha should have had a purple line on it or move to make it um, better. Um, essentially, we looked at it and thought nobody would be silly enough to go straight um, because, because the, the time saved was was minimal and there was a fence to get through um, and what we hadn't taken into account was that this was 80 percent of the way around a high speed race yeah. and, you know and, and out of the 50 people going through a percentage are not going to be thinking rationally um, anyway so uh, you've got to cater for everybody um, and we should have should have planned it out before before it happened um, so anyway, that's my confession for the night. But, but also, <laughs> it's not your course, um, is it? It's the planner's course, and and we always try and see the planner's side. No, I, I, I'd argue we see the competitor's side. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Well, yeah. Sorry, that's sorry. Semantic. Yeah, it's the planner's course, and and it should be a fair course. Yeah. And part of the competitor, the controller's role is to represent the competitor's view. <laughs> and the landowners and everybody yeah. else. <laughs> yeah. um, but you do hear the planner's voice. Absolutely. Mm. Um, that can be very uh, convincing. OK, um, if we can just wrap up juries, a um, few things to say, and these will be slightly random. In the last two years, probably, I've been on three and a half juries. Um, the half 
was, as people have described, being asked by the organiser or the planner, what do you think you ought to do? You're on the jury, so you must be ultra knowledgeable. Um, and, and having to say, nothing to do with me, Gov, until yeah. such time as a protest is made. Um, so it is really important that process is followed, even if it feels bureaucratic to say, you're the organiser. A um, cu couple of you know, stray comments. If you looked at scenario one, the first thing that the organiser said was, I sympathise with the complainant. And I think there is quite a lot of work to be done here about dealing with unhappy competitors um, in a sympathetic but not weak manner. Um, and, and being able to say sorry um, diffuses an awful lot of problems. Um, if you simply say, well, rule 7.3 says, um, that's likely to get them looking at the rules and quoting some other one back at you. Um, but recognising that something's gone wrong or potentially gone wrong or is perceived to have gone wrong from their side might diffuse a lot of the, the issues that we face. Um, the, the next thing to say is that when a complaint goes in and or a protest goes in, um, there are people and, and typically the organiser, the planner and the controller who feel terrible. Yeah. Uh, you know, they've worked for six months or a year on this and it might have been their fault, like, like this, you know, one where as control I take responsibility. Um, yes, they may have um, not got everything perfect, but um, they feel absolutely gutted that the controller has remarkably little to do once the complaint and the protest have gone in. They, they are rather sidelined. Um, and maybe that's right, but it doesn't feel right if you're that controller. So, as I say, there's quite a lot of people management to be thought about there when competitors put in complaints or think they're going to put in complaints. Um, right. Are you happy that we move on? Yeah. We've got a bit more to get through. Alan, can I just have a 30 seconds? Sure. Yeah. Um, right. Just to bring this into the context of, of major events, I've been involved with this sort of thing in, in lots of um, events in the past, and so is Alan. If you're organising a level A event, you really need to be on the ball about how you're going to deal with complaints. And it's almost worth having someone in the field who you point out and say, go and sort it out with them. He's got the stock of forms. Talk it through with them. Because as an organiser, you don't want to be trying to do that in real time. We've got other things on. But at, certainly at major events, it's very useful to have someone who un understands the process, can manage the process. I, I've, I've actually walked a bit of paper around the field, getting all the signatures and things at a JK before to, to try and get a, a protest and, and a complaint sorted out. So uh, it's worth thinking about having someone whose only role is to deal with complaints and make sure that the rules are followed in the way that's managed. Yeah, thank you. OK, uh, I, I, I've just got a quick point. Uh, um, Simon alluded to it. Uh, there is actually a an IOF uh, yeah. complaint protest form, which uh, BOF also use, and it's on both of their websites. And not everybody's aware of, of, the, of its existence. And it's essential uh, that the um, inquiries has a stock of those printed off uh, um, because it makes it very much easier to deal with the uh, complaint which may then turn into a protest if everybody if everything is written down on this form uh, in the right places yeah and and you are actually tackling what they've put on the form not what they may have said at, at length and you've got to try and remember it you actually address what what was on the complaint form so agreed okay onwards and and just on that and also you have the the correct forms and the correct format for a, a world ranking event as part of the documentation you've returned to the iof of the of what complaints and protests were received if you've got all the, the forms rather than scrappy bits of paper yeah Right, th those three scenarios um, all had an element of truth about them. Um, you know, they all happened in one, 
you know, it was, there was slight um, shorthand in what you were told, but they have happened. Um, you won't have known they happened unless you've been to this webinar. So anybody who wasn't here won't have learnt from those. So I just want to very briefly go on to the talking about learning from past events. At the moment, we have no system for BOF events of knowing what happened, what went well, what didn't. Um, so can you just have a, you know, 10 seconds thinking time? Um, we can carry on as we are, have no formal system, it saves a lot of paperwork, etc. Or we could in introduce a formal system. And I just am interested to know whether there is any groundswell out there um, to get some feedback. And then that, that brings in some questions. Um, what's manageable? Are we just talking major events, all events? Who would be involved, etc. cetera? Um, speaking, I'm slightly biased on this. If we do review past events somehow successfully, then there are some, some benefits and you can see them on the screen. We learn from what went well, what didn't go well, we should be able to save future officials time and stress levels. And we ought to be able to evolve and adapt. Um, we used to have um, major events, conferences, controllers conferences. And I think post COVID, they, those are increasingly difficult to arrange. And you can't always get the right people in the, in the right room. Um, but is this a time to start developing some sort of review system. Uh, I'm, I am a complete ignoramus about this, but the IOF do a lot of reviewing of their major events. Um, yeah. They have webinars um, where people present, for example, what, what went really well, spectacular arenas, and what didn't go well. Um, and there was an, clearly an issue at JWOP 2023 where the, uh, the map rubbed off. Yeah. Now, those sorts of things you need to know to avoid happening again. Um, and I, I'm worried that at the moment we are likely to re repeat errors or repeat problems simply because there's no way of capturing them. Um, this is a, just, just a random screenshot from reviewing what, what happened last year. And we don't need to look at them, you know, go through them. But I think, and David might correct me on this, th this is really on, on the principle of no blame, um, but let's talk it through. Um, you know, it, it, it's being encouraged to say what went well, what didn't go well um, for future, future officials. And they are developing a quality index where they've broken it broken events down into eight areas um, different weightings and they have assessors who will assess each event um, we could go for this this may be appropriate may be completely over the top but joe are you in a position to launch a little poll so hopefully on your screen you get some very broad questions and you're not committing anything. You're not signing up to anything by saying yes or no. I'll, I'll just read out the questions once again, just for anybody who hasn't um, been able to get that. If they do want to pop a response in either Q&A or chat, I know this might not help you out, unfortunately. Um, so it's just a yes, no on do we need some sort of national feedback system? And second one is assuming we do have one, would it be just level A or some other levels as well? Almost everybody saying, yes, we need a system. And a third saying just level A, two thirds saying more, some some distance down the food chain, um, perhaps possibly. So thank you for that. Alan, can I say something about the assessors? We sure. uh, we were we were in the um, IOF uh, higher level conference in Budapest, um, and this was raised. And some people think it is the the per, the people who run the events are setting themselves. So just 
to be devil advocate. Yeah. And this is despite the fact that two of the assessors are actually are, top athletes. Yeah. Um, one man, one woman. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I'm I'm just holding that up as one one yeah. model that's out there. Um I'm very conscious that I can't, you know, buy a buy a toothbrush without getting a survey to fill in from uh, whoever I'm not from, yeah. you know, these days. Um, but in orienteering, it, it's very rare that we get a a, you know, a, a questionnaire to fill in after the event. And if we do get that questionnaire, I don't know what the results were. Yeah. So, so you know, we're getting some feedback, we're, but we're not closing the loop at all. Um, so I think it's really encouraging that, was it 98% are saying, yes, we should have something. Um, now, perhaps we need to work on quite what that might look like, make it manageable, make it uh, effective. Um, and in particular, be able to inform future events. So um, that, that was just a, I thought I'd throw it out there and see what happened and thank you very much. Um, I'm sure nothing's gonna happen instantly. <laughs> no, and, and one point just picking up on that, Alan, mm -hmm. is that obviously world ranking events have this already. So yeah. at the end of world ranking event, you do an event advisor does a report and it's meant to mention what went well and what didn't go so well. That goes into the National Federation. So they go into the BOF office. They're probably, they probably just die there. Um, I don't know, but it, they might be an initial source of data um, and you could develop that into a system for level A's. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm conscious of time, so I'm gonna whiz on now, if that's all right. Um, when you registered, there were, um, there was space for you to say, what else would you like to talk about? Um, and I've just picked out a very few. Um, there was several comments about fiscal difficulty and whether there should be more guidance than there is at the moment. And it links into what we were talking about with older competitors. So I think that's a possible. And, and one person said borderliners already have such, such guidance. So maybe there's a possibility of reusing and recycling um, and, and making that available. I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, somebody said, when do we need map reclaim at events? And the honest answer is, I don't know. Um, as to where, you know, clearly in relays, there's, there's a lot of purpose in having it. Um, but at other major events, I, th I think it's, it's organizers decision, isn't it? Um, and I, I suspect we don't have a problem, but somebody has asked that as a as a question. Uh, somebody else has said, has anybody had to use backup timings? And I suspect with with SI, et cetera, less so than than before. We did the whole of the Jaywalk sprint race in 2009 on backup timing. Really? Successfully? <laughs> yes. Well, just about. Okay. I was up all the night to do it. but. <laughs> OK. Um, the question raised by John, I think, about um and it is a rule, it is an IOF rule, by the way, just to be to be clear. Yes, the yes. timing system is mandatory for IOF races. Yeah. But but also sort of advisable for major events. Yeah. For oh, us yeah. anyway. No, it's um, mandatory for level A's. Is, isn't it? Um Trello, um, whether it's something that happens on the same weekend as the JK, uh, whether it's linked or whether it's embedded. Um, and that's, I think, a discussion that needs developing um, between organisers and, and Trello officials. Um, and then there was a question about M75s having longer courses, which I think David May probably dealt with last week, the week before, week before, um, over the... Uh, adjustments because of speeds. Um, there was a question about offset circles, uh, particularly on sprint maps, which got me interested because um, I hadn't really thought about this. And we've got two rules. One that says the circle should be drawn so that the symbol lies exactly at the center. And the, the, other, the other one says um, you ought to offset it. So um, interesting that, that 
they seem to be saying different things. The, the, the one at the top with the wall, is that drawn symbolically? And the answer is yes, in one dimension and not in the other. Because its length is correct, but its width is symbolic. Mm. So um, I just thought that was interesting. And if you're running a sprint event, then uh, think about it and try and come up with a, a solution. But um, the, the ISOM standard sets how you should be drawing the circle. So you should offset it? It should be centered on point features and offset for others. It is a wall a point feature. It's an area no. feature. I know it's a not silly a point, question. Not a point feature. Okay. Um, as I say, I don't know the answer to this, but there seems to be, um, particularly in sprint, a need to not have to look at your descriptions. You look at where the circle is in general uh, without having to worry about whether it's left or right of, this, of the wall. So, uh, as I say, something to think about if you're planning a sprint. Alan, can I just comment on that? Because since yeah. those, both, those examples are both mine from the British sprints and I planned and drew the map, um, okay. we uh, we offset those. So Tony Thornley and I discussed this at great length and we felt that we, we had to offset to make sure it was clear to the competitors, particularly that lower one you can see. Yeah. Uh, it was extremely confusing when we did not offset. So just to fight my own corner there. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Um, I think I had that control as well. Thank you. <laughs> um, OK, almost there. Uh, some of you are attending um, because you are interested in becoming a level A controller. Um, I will send you an application form if you're well, whether you're interested or not. Just don't return it if you're not. Uh, it will need signing off by your region and then sending back to me. And then I recommend it to events and competitions committee. Um, but we need more level A con controllers, just as we need more event advisors. And I will be sending out an email soon asking for controllers for these events. Um, so the Campus Sport Cup final in October 24, British Knights, 25, British Middle Distance 25, British Sprints. 25 and at the moment we don't have a long distance or a relay British relays but they are Mike Cope is working really hard I think to try to um, get them allocated but if you're a level A then there will be an email coming out fairly soon saying are you interested in putting your name forward that I think is the end um, can I just thank all the presenters, all the participants? Can I thank Joe for driving so well? Um, and, and I think we've all learned a lot about teams. <laughs> yep. um, but yeah, th this has been a, um, a proof of concept because we haven't had this sort of webinar um, ever. Uh, and, and COVID has made us change ways of working. And I hope you've uh, got something out of it. So any other final comments or is it good night? Um, I'll, I'll add on a little bit um, just to say a big thank you as well to uh, everyone who's attended all the sessions, uh, everyone who's uh, presented in all our sessions. So Alan, Ronan, and Julie, uh, Simon, Neil, Barry and David as well. Um, every It's been a lot of important work behind the scenes that's gone on to make all this happen. It's been brilliant to have such a strong turnout for all these. Um, and yeah, I'm sure everybody has learned some things about teams. And if I'm doing my job right, it means that people shouldn't have to learn anywhere near as much as I've had to learn about teams as of recent. So uh, hopefully that should uh, keep, uh, you know, that should mark well for the future, you know, when doing this again. Um, it, it's been absolutely brilliant and look forward to uh, hopefully seeing you all back here for the next one. Um, so if there's, I can see a lot of the messages in the chat. It's a, it's really good to see that. Um, as, as always, uh, I'll be, uploading, editing, recording the video. Um, it might take a little bit longer on this one with the breakout rooms as it did next time. So I'd expect that possibly Wednesday. And um, we'll also uh, be sending out the feedback form again. We've been collating all those. So any extra questions on the feedback forms, uh, we are going to get all together an answer. And hopefully we should get that over to you uh, sometime next week. Fingers crossed. 
Um, but apart from that, um, just want to thank you all again for attending and uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, thank you Joe. Thank you, Joe.